I agree with what the other uh, panelists um, have proposed. What I'm concerned about is sustainability, and I'm concerned about cost. Um, if you look at major activities of the United States government in the past, these things sort of spike, you know? It's like a fire drill. Everyone runs in one direction, spends a lot of money, doesn't. What we really need to do as a country, and you being here, I think, are active participants in this, and the government really can't decide for you. We have to decide where exactly do we want to peg the resource piece, and how do we want to go about um, countering terrorism to protect our people. Uh, I think that the future is challenging. I certainly do agree with the other panelists. Not only is this not over, but we have to, as adults and as thought leaders, really look at depreciation that um, we can be struck. And then the next thinking ahead of that is, as a country and as a society, how are we going to react to that? That's almost as important as how we're struck, the losses we take, how we conduct ourselves as the world's leading democracy and go forward to continue to, to protect our people. There's a lot of issues. All of you have a role to play in this, but tactically, are we safer? I would say we being the United States, yes for now, our immediate allies. Things can change dramatically. If I can just say one last thing. You know this thing of probability. If you do counterterrorism your whole life, you love certainty. It's almost like risk. And I was, my wife had me cleaning up in the kitchen. This is what I've come to. And I was looking at a Clorox bottle. It says kills 99.9% .9 germs. And I was thinking how envious I am. Just to be able to say 99.9% .9 of anything. But then, being a career counterterrorist, I was thinking to myself, well, how long does this Clorox last? And how about that 1%? You know? So safer, yes, but we're not anywhere near 99.9. We're a lot less than that. We need to continue to devote the resources, look towards the future. With full appreciation, we can be struck. And we're going to have to deal with that in as effective and professional and sustainable a manner as possible. Thank you. Arif Ali Khan. Thank you, Peter, and, and thank you for the invitation to be here today and all of you, especially in the discussions we've had this morning, the working groups. Um, I, I'm kind of inclined to answer the question either yes or no and stop there, but I won't. Um, I, I, I think we are safer, um, but it very much depends on safer from what. Uh, and that's a critical question because there are many things that have been done uh, by the government, by our communities, by state and local governments to deal with threats as we knew them. Uh, and as we hopefully know them now, uh, are we safer, especially the, uh, uh, against a, a spectacular uh, and horrific attack as in 9-11? Uh, I think so. Um, but the key is to understand that threats are not static. They evolve. And they constantly evolve. Because similar to uh, my, my background is in actually in, in the criminal justice system as a prosecutor, not a defendant. And uh, I, uh, dealing with crime, you always have to stay ahead of the criminal because criminals tend to be very smart and they see the, the, the things that we do and they work around them. It's no different with terrorists. Terrorists are always looking at where is the vulnerability. And the challenge for us in government um, is not only to anticipate what that threat is going to be, see its evolution, but one of the most challenging things in a government that is quite large um, that is not necessarily nimble and flexible, is to be able to take those anticipated threats and move it into action. Um, and I think, uh, as Ambassador uh, Black had mentioned, you know, pre-9-11, there, there are concerns about these things, but to mobilize uh, an apparatus to for that anticipated threat is very challenging. Um, and to mobilize the community. Uh, as, as Fran Townsend mentioned, Communities have to be part of the solution. They are part of the solution, especially in our democracy. And one of those challenges is complacency. We should not be event-driven in the way we're creating policies, because if the event happens, it's too late. And being able to anticipate that event, prevent that event, is so critical. And we cannot do that unless we have the support and the involvement of the American public to recognize that they have a role in keeping our country safer. And just one last thing is that um, Fran had mentioned the importance of state and local governments. I was a deputy mayor of Homeland Security and Public Safety in Los Angeles, um, certainly another uh, major target of terrorists and has been in the past. Um, and I can't uh, emphasize enough that the, the involvement, the coordination, the sharing, the education, not only with local communities but local government, is, is an, a critically important aspect of keeping our communities safe, whether it's from terrorism or any other type of violence. 
Thank you, Arif. I want to pick up on a point that was raised by you, Arif, but also by you, Fran. You both uh, talked about the evolution of the threat, and you mentioned the fact that more people, more Americans were arrested this year for um, attempted attacks or involvement in violent extremism than previously. Do you think that has been a sudden change? And if so, why? Yeah, I, it, it's not a sudden change. Going back to my time in government, I left the White House in January of 2008. Um, we had already seen a, a very uh, deliberate strategic decision undertaken by Al Qaeda and its sort of network to look for either Americans or those who ha could travel, permanent resident aliens, people who had the ability to travel with less scrutiny across American borders. And so it was clear that that was a strategic objective. You add to that then uh, the American Yemeni cleric Anwar al-Awlaki, Adam Gadan, uh, the California al-Qaeda member, people who understand our culture, understand the idiomatics of our language and, and the way we think, who can appeal to those who may be radicalized, and you add technology, you add things like the internet, and you understood, we understood that this was an emerging threat that we had to deal with. Remember, not only did you have the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security, you also had this new division in the FBI, the National Security Division, whose entire premise was to work with state and locals to gather intelligence to prevent terrorist attacks. And so w the government was moving actually with the threat as big and oftentimes awkward as the government can be, it, we saw that and we were moving with it. And I think the current administration has very much continued that. I'd, I'd like to add one other thought to that, though, before I close. And that is, you know, when we look at this homegrown threat and the number of arrests, I, I think it's difficult in a moment of crisis to, re, to realize and recognize that the difference between 3,000 people murdered on 9-11 to a guy who can't put a bomb together correctly in his underpants or in a truck in Times Square is very definite proof of a weakening of their capability. And that we can discuss why those reasons are, but and it, the threat has emerged. It's real, but I, I think we've seen a weakening of their capability as a result of a sustained effort in this country. Mm. Arif, is that your assessment also? I, I, I don't think we should be surprised about a spike in activity. Um, but I think, as, as France said, we've seen an evolution of the type of activity uh, that's being conducted. And y although it's hard to make some sort of qualitative assessment, um, uh, I think we always have to be vigilant for those types of things to happen. Uh, threats of terrorism existed before 9-11. They exist after 9-11. Um, and unfortunately, I think they'll continue. The key is what are we doing to try to learn from the past, anticipate the future, and take action to address that. Mm -hmm. Steve, you wanted to, well, you strongly agreed with Fran uh, 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 about the weakening of, of, of Al Qaeda central. Well, I, I, I do. I mean, one of my New America Foundation colleagues now, Phil Mudd, who was uh, head of, I guess, intelligence and terrorism for years for the FBI, makes very much the same point that, that Fran makes, and that many of the networks have been broken down, the, the, the core capabilities to, to move across lines have been broken down. Um, he worried about the New York Times bombing as being another case where you can overreact and over you can hyperventilate about the wrong things and begin driving your behavior. This is my bigger concern: um, is how do you take a society like ours that you know we did have Timothy McVeigh, we did have the Unabomber, uh, Japan had Om Shin Rikyo. It's not to talk about. Uh, the fact that we should have, uh, that we should get used to all of this, but I guess I do mean how do you build an internal resilience at some level to an inevitability so that you don't allow uh, those that would like us to, pr to provoke us to engage in behaviors that actually disrupt and change the society, our direction, and our larger strategic course. That is, when you read Peter Bergen's interview that he did with Osama bin Laden, uh, Bin Laden was fascinating in how he projected what he was going to do, how he was going to pinprick the United States, and, and via the way we did. I mean, to some degree, the flotilla recently in the Gaza crisis with Israel had some of those same characteristics. How can you make a superpower behave in certain ways that it undermines itself? 